morning scripture reading is uh, from the Old Testament is Psalm 91, verses 1 through 6, and then 14 through 16. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. And on to verses 14 through 16. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. The next scripture reading comes from uh, Paul's first letter to Timothy, uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 19. Actually, godliness is a great source of profit when it is combined with being happy with what you already have. We didn't bring anything into the world, and so we can't take anything out of it. We'll be happy with food and clothing. But people who are trying to get rich fall into temptation. They are trapped by many stupid and harmful passions that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some have wandered away from the faith and have impaled themselves with a lot of pain because they made money their goal. But as for you, man of God, run away from all these things. Instead, pursue righteousness, holy living, faithfulness, love, endurance, and gentleness. A compete in the good faith of fight or fight of faith, a grab hold of eternal life, you were called to it, and you made a good confession of it in the presence of many witnesses. I command you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, and Christ Jesus, who made the good confession when testifying before Pontius Pilate, obey this order without fault or failure until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. The timing of this appearance is revealed by God alone, who is the blessed and only master, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone has immortality and lives in light that no one can come near. And no human being has ever seen or is able to see him. Honor and eternal power belong to him. Amen. I tell people who are rich at this time not to become egotistical and not to place their hope on their finances, which are uncertain. Instead, they need to hope in God, who richly provides everything for our enjoyment. I tell them to do good, to be rich in the good things they do, to be generous and to share with others. When they do these things, they will save a treasure for themselves that is a good foundation for the future. And that way they can take hold of what is truly life. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Paul, addressing people, addresses specific qualities that go hand in hand with following Jesus Christ in this letter that he sends to Timothy. There are certain traits and desires that we should avoid, and there are ones that we should more ardently follow and pursue in life. So whatever we feel we are called to, these are certain things that can help us and guide us and lead us and teach us. So today we'll be focusing on what I call six pursuits that Paul encourages us to do. And I felt 10 minutes per each pursuit is fine. So we'll have a 60-minute sermon for you guys this morning. So just get comfortable, sit tight, and then we'll do the food. I'm I'm just kidding, of course. It won't be 10 minutes apiece. So it'll it'll be my average sermon-like. So you've got that to be comforted with at least. So we have these six pursuits that are kind of listed in this letter to Timothy. Six things that we can follow or add to our life to improve it and make it a little bit better for ourselves and the people around us. So one major point that kind of drives this pursuit of six is what is exhorted by the author. The dangers of the pursuit of wealth. Now let's be clear. You know, making money and earning a living is certainly fine and okay in life, right? And that's perfectly fine and we need to just pretty much do that to survive and live, right? But when it's the pursuit of wealth... 
that becomes the sole focus, then other areas of our life might get a little compromised or we might lose sight of or neglect certain areas altogether. So there are plenty of examples of how this pursuit of wealth can naturally rain some destruction or affect this world and other people and even ourselves in a negative way. I could probably name or list a hundred different ways in which we are affected or could be affected by this strictly pursuit of wealth. But two kind of main points come to mind. One is an issue that Walmart had a few years ago that I'll I'll talk about, and another one is one that affects us right here in central Florida. So the first portion in regards to Walmart has to deal with a story that I heard and read maybe about six or seven years ago. I haven't researched it lately, but I figure it's still true, or maybe it changed or improved, hopefully, along the way. But apparently, Walmart had a great deal of salmon farms they housed and kept in South America. So apparently having such large fish farms would result in a great deal of hazardous waste being produced and that they would need to dispose of. However, the cost of disposing of it properly far exceeded the fine that would be levied had they just dumped it in the ocean. So due to the pursuit of wealth, what do you think the option was that they chose? I said, well, we'll just dump it in the ocean. It's cheaper that way. We don't have to dispose of it properly. And the fine they levy to us is less than what it would cost us to dispose of it properly. So naturally, naturally in the pursuit of pursuing wealth and maximizing profits, they just dumped the waste in the ocean. So that's, I guess, how they keep prices falling, right? Just keep costs down. So the other example is a real and a very, uh, albeit a little scary, issue of human trafficking, right? So in our day, human trafficking serves as a poignant example of the destructive pursuit of wealth. So in the past 15 years, as many as 2 million people have left their homes and entered into human slavery every single year. 2 million people a year for the past 15 years. So if you're doing the math at home, that's about 30 million people that are humanly trafficked in this world. So the trafficking of persons is estimated to net around $10 billion annually. $10 billion for the buying and selling of human people. So many suffer repeated physical and emotional forms of violence that threaten the very existence of human beings. A majority of these persons are forced into sex work or hard labor or servitude. And so while Paul was not likely thinking of human slavery when he detailed the destruction wrought by pursuit of wealth, the problem of human trafficking illustrates this point very candidly. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So again, I highly doubt this would be taking place if there wasn't money to be had or money to be earned in it, right? But you see that figure of $10 billion, say, oh, I'd like a nice little slice of that pie. What's the difference if I compromise my morals and buy and sell human souls, right? So due to this dangerous pursuit of wealth, we are instead strongly encouraged to pursue six other godly or holy attributes or traits that not only help to combat our thirst for wealth, but also to provide for our stability, our strength, and our faith in a world that's ever-changing. So first we begin with righteousness. That's pursuit number one, which is defined as the quality of being morally right or justifiable. So this one can be a tad little tricky, but I feel there's a lot of value within it, right? So the pursuit of this would clearly outweigh the option of whether or not to dump hazardous waste into the ocean or dispose of it properly. Likewise, if this were a strong pursuit and strong enough factor for some, I would imagine that they would see a great deal wrong with human or sex trafficking that seems to take place in this world. See, if our righteousness is strong enough, we'll think, oh, maybe we shouldn't dump this toxic waste in the ocean. And we'll just pay a little bit more and dispose of it properly. Or maybe we really shouldn't buy and sell human beings into slavery. Maybe there is something really wrong with that, right? Right? Yet if we continue to ignore the pursuit of righteousness, then these moral fibers that we have strongly bend or get completely broken, and it's tough to kind of put those back. Or you might find a way to kind of justify bending those moral standards and leaving righteousness in the dust altogether. So as a result, we have to continue to focus on doing what's right in God's eyes and for the betterment of the world and the people that live within that world. 
So it means being a good Samaritan to those in need. It means we should do the right things even if others are trying their hardest to convince us otherwise. It only means we remain faithful to Christ and uh, we would be best to follow his will and not necessarily the will of the world. So after righteousness, we have pursuit number two, holy living, which uh, some translations define as godliness. But holy living sounds like the next TV show on HGTV, right? Come see holy living. Let's see how we can live this righteous little world and live in a good, godly way. Yeah, this could go in a number of different directions, but I happened to stumble upon a blog uh, this past week that detailed a couple of different ways in which they felt holy living uh, could be justified and kind of named and specifically stated. So one of the first items they said is to disconnect from the world. But to me, this seems like rather sage advice, especially with social constructs like Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat and all that kind of stuff. It's extremely easy for us to compare ourselves to other people, Right? And I feel doing that on a steady basis just makes both ends of the spectrum kind of dangerous for us. So if we view ourselves as being in a better situation than someone else, we have a tendency to view someone as maybe lesser or inferior or less successful or maybe paint them as a failure in life or one that's not as good or maybe not as blessed as we might be. So then we develop a superiority complex saying they must have done something wrong or they must have had something that happened to them along the way that I didn't have happen to me. So that's their fault, and I'm a better person because of that. Or on the flip side of that coin, we feel a little inferior too, right? So this is strongly the case if we constantly compare ourselves to friends or acquaintances. I mean, we're jealous of a perceived better house that they might have or be living in in their life. And maybe we feel as if our life is not as bountiful as someone else due to financial constraints or obligations that we have in life. So ultimately, this disconnect from the world has its motivation in not falling into and pursuing worldly desires and instead following God. But the technological disconnect, I feel, is important as well. The other point of holy living I appreciated was an, an encouragement to flee from temptation. So we all know that the easiest path is not always the best one to choose. Yet somehow we still manage to get there, right? We cut corners, we take shortcuts, and we just kind of give in every once in a while to temptation. It's easy to do. But if we resist that, then we continue to constitute holy living, right? But there are certain ways we can cut temptation out of our life. I'm a big fan of chocolate, in case you haven't heard or, or don't know that. So if I don't want to be tempted by chocolate, I probably shouldn't keep a whole bag of Three Musketeers in my desk drawer in the afternoon, right? Let's just take it out and, and remove it and put it somewhere else. That's an easy way to cut out temptation for me in life. But sometimes it's easier to pay the fine than it is to dispose of toxic waste properly. So the temptation is to just pay that cheaper fine. But sometimes it's easier for others to cheat on an international business test rather than to study and take the time to study for that as well. Ergo, we need to avoid temptation, or at least not put it upon ourselves or make it easily accessible in life. So following holy living and godliness, we are implored to faithfulness. Now, the biggest way that faithfulness can make an impact is our faithfulness to God. So it doesn't do any good to show up just for worship on Sundays, although that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm glad you guys are here, and thank you for being here on Sunday. But we've got to do a little bit more than that to be faithful to God. Maybe we should read a little more scripture. Maybe we could pray a little bit more or do things for other people or volunteer or what have you. And so this faithfulness could be summed up within the confines of other pursuits that we've mentioned and one that is coming up living holy, exhibiting righteousness, exuding love. So more or less, that means we put God first and make God a priority in our life. Uh, that's how we display faithfulness. The God first and our other priorities come after that. And next up, we have love, which is pretty self-explanatory. And I've probably preached 800 sermons on just love in itself over the course of of many years. You guys know what it is. I talked about the five love languages, how we share those, and how we fill our love tanks. So I'm not going to really talk much more about love. You guys get the idea. I'll just leave you with a title of a Beatles song, and we'll go from there. 
So all you need is love, right? Just take that with you and, and go throughout your day. So that's, that'll cover love for today, right? Uh, so after love, we have the pursuit of endurance. Now, one might think this is an easy trait to keep and follow. However, it's much um, uh, more challenging when we try to apply it to our life and try to negate our pursuit of wealth or other traits that are deemed not so worthy of Christendom. For example, there will be many situations in our life and circumstances that will continue to draw us into a particular pursuit of wealth, right? The shareholders want better returns on their investment, so we maximize profits. We cut corners and we dump that waste in the ocean to maximize that number. We remember the time where we were poor and destitute and on the streets and not knowing where our next meal might come from. And so we're pushed to a point of desperation. So as a result, we somehow found ourselves active in the human trafficking ring for seven plus years. And we need to find a way to develop an immunity and strengthen our endurance so that we are capable of refraining from pursuing that path of wealth. So other methods involve planning and preparing for situations or learning from previous experiences to be better equipped for future occurrences that might test our endurance. And maybe we struggle with telling others no. So we need to find a way of how to condition ourselves and how to better combat that so that we're stronger and that we feel we're not getting pulled in 8 million different directions and our well-being is compromised. But do we wear down eventually if someone asks us to go against our holy living day in and day out? And then we need to find a way to prevent us from being susceptible to those requests. Do we have a friend or a significant other that is encouraging us to avoid church and to give in to temptations every so often? Then we need to find a way to develop and resist those requests. And on the sixth and final pursuit, we are called to follow is gentleness. Now, as a male, I feel comfortable admitting that we're not usually associated with gentleness, Right? We're usually big, burly, clumsy, and all around rugged and rough, especially me, a super tough pastor type, right? <laughs> well, for the most part. I'm, I'm a little different. I'm a little more gentle than most. I've got a little softer side and can be a little sensitive from time to time. But there's certainly something to be said for true, genuine gentleness. You see, it is in through gentleness that one learns to treat others with respect and understanding. This is where harsh judgment and criticism flies out the window. This is where one conveys empathy, compassion, and kindness. This is where one makes one other person or others feel safer, secure, and comfortable, as opposed to uncomfortable, anxious, and a little uneasy. There's a great deal to be said about gentleness. So hopefully we can find some way to get to the point where we are more gentle and more forgiving in our day-to-day -day living. So essentially, we rely on hope. It's the hope that with all of these six pursuits, we can maintain a life and a lifestyle that would be pleasing to God. The hope is that we can refrain from strictly pursuing wealth as a means to an end. The hope is that we continue to make this world a better place, we can improve our own lives and improve the lives of others around us, including those that we love, those that we find a little harder to love, and those that we don't even know. So we all could start somewhere. And maybe we're a person that exhibits one, two, or five, or all six of these traits already. And that's great. And maybe we can find a way to improve them. But if not, maybe we can at least start by implementing one of them into our lives. Maybe we start with a focus of being a little more gentle this week to those around us. And maybe we find a way to live a little more holy in our life. Or maybe we find a way to rely on righteousness and have that be a backbone for our living going forward. Maybe we start with one and then get to two or three and eventually we have all six of these traits and all six of these attributes as a part of our daily life living. But wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't we be better off for that? Wouldn't the people around us love us and appreciate us so much more? Wouldn't the world be a much better place? I feel if we could get to any point of these, 
one out of six, two out of six, or six out of six, then Paul would be most pleased. He would say, yes, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you can do this. And we can be followers of Christ. We can make this world better. But it starts with us and pursuing those six. That's how it's done, and that's how we make this world better. Amen.